Welcome to the Bright Side Lounge. My name's Sabra Lane. What's the Bright Side? It is a newsletter I'm regularly putting together, putting a spotlight on solutions journalism. What's that? Well, it is what it says. We report not just on the problems, but possible solutions to those problems. Today, we're going to focus on some environment and greenhouse stories or climate change stories. I think they're a pretty interesting collection of yarns. And a spoiler alert, at some points during this, I might stop the stories and just give you a few snippets or analysis on, on what I think. Now, first up, we're going to take you to the town of Barcoolden in central Queensland. It's smack bang in the middle of the state. Now, political tragics, like me, will know this place as the birthplace of the Labor Party in the late 1800s and also its home to the tree of knowledge. These days, some pretty exciting developments are happening there. It's becoming a renewable energy hub. Let's have a look. When James and Richard Edgerton returned to their parents' sheep and cattle station outside of Bar Calden a few years ago, starting a new business wasn't on the radar. But the hectares of felled gidgee trees strewn across their land and a chance conversation at a local race meet changed all that. Local beef producers were using charcoal in supplements for their livestock. The brothers started experimenting, built a kiln and suddenly they were in the charcoal business. Charcoal wasn't just good for uh, use in agriculture or horticulture. It's also really good for barbecues and restaurants, um, filtration, um, healthcare. Now the pair works in tandem, first collecting the wood, then splitting it into lengths before baking it in the kiln devoid of oxygen for hours. Once cooled, the end product is grated, the premium charcoal bagged for the burgeoning barbecue markets. They're about to become part of a renewable energy industry hub in the middle of the outback that will produce zero net emissions. It's believed to be an Australian first. Each business using the waste or byproducts of others to fuel their own operations, as well as solar, wind and steam. It's the brainchild of Professor Ross Garno, a leading economist who's also chairman of Sunshot Industries. Now we're gonna pause the story here for just a moment. Professor Ross Garno really knows what he's talking about. This guy is known right around the world because he's a deep economic thinker. He has thought a lot in recent years about climate change. In fact, he wrote the first blueprint on greenhouse gas policy here in Australia more than a decade ago. Now, his idea then of an emissions trading scheme wasn't taken up, but this guy really does know what he's talking about. A leading economist who's also chairman of Sunshot Industries. The company is in a joint venture with seven local councils to establish the hub. There's an opportunity uh, in a place like uh, Buckhorn first to provide low cost renewable energy and that's going to be very scarce and valuable in, as the world m moves towards zero emissions. There are likely to be other spin-offs too. In a small town like Bar Calden, which has seen its population plummet over the past decade, the renewable energy hub is expected to provide up to 400 new jobs. And that brings people to the region. That big sort of box slatted structure that you can see in the street, that has been built around the tree of knowledge where the Labor Party uh, was formed in 1891. Now, the tree was poisoned more than a decade ago and this sculpture has gone up around it since to sort of mark its spot. Anyway, we'll continue. The move to uh, zero emissions uh, e economics, uh, which is inevitable because we have to address the problem of climate change, it's inevitable, but it will be great for the economies of rural and provincial Australia. Where there's plenty of land, wind, and sun. Now if that project's a success, you can bet it'll be copied elsewhere. Now we're going to zip down to the southern coast to Tasmania, to a beautiful part of coastline. And yes, I am biased because I live down here now. Not so long ago, it used to be home to some beautiful giant kelp forests, but these have disappeared even in my lifetime. But all is not lost. There's an experiment going on down here to try and regenerate some of that kelp. Let's have a look. 
a hidden underwater world being brought back from the brink. To be diving in 30 metres of water with the kelp going from the, you know, right to the surface was absolutely magnificent. So to see all of that just disappear was absolutely astonishing. Giant kelp is the largest marine algae in the world. It grows up to 40 metres tall. 95% of giant kelp forests in Tasmania have disappeared. The decline has been accelerated by the extension of the East Australian current. So it's a warm, nutrient-poor current that flows down from mainland Australia. And it's getting stronger with climate change and bringing that warm, nutrient-poor EAC water to Tassie. But there's new hope for the underwater habitat. A year ago, scientists collected spores from the reproductive leaves of some of the last remaining kelp and placed them on the ocean floor. They've taken off, with some reaching 12 metres. It's really encouraging every time we're able to come out here and check up on them and measure them and see how they're going to jump in and now see this little patch which starts to look a little bit like a giant kelp forest, a little bit like they used to look in areas. So yeah, it's been very exciting so far for us. The project has a dual benefit. The selective breeding will also help the commercial production of the kelp. It's a great outcome for marine environment, it's a great outcome for the economy. Um, and the potential for that industry is, is really a very significant potential. The next challenge for the kelp here is to survive the summer and the warmer water that comes with it. If it does, it's hoped these forests will kickstart a natural cycle that will make them not only self-sustaining, but self-expanding. Aren't those kelp forests amazing? It's almost tempting for me to put back on my mask and fins and scuba outfit and go for a dive, but the water here I think would just be too cold. Now our next yarn, we're going to look specifically at concrete. Do you know that's responsible for about 8% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions? In fact, if it was a country, it would be the third largest emitter behind China and the United States. That's why this next story is so important, not just here in Australia, but around the world. Australia's largest supplier of building products is changing the way it makes concrete. Every gram of cement we take out, we reduce the CO2 content. Carbon dioxide is released when the materials used to make cement, including limestone, are heated in a kiln. That production process accounts for around 7% of global emissions. So companies like Boral are developing alternatives. If you think about road infrastructure, there are a couple of state governments that are specifying low carbon concrete. Using lower emissions materials can help a building earn green credentials. The industry-led Green Building Council is expanding its rating system from commercial properties to new homes. The biggest asset in your entire life, your house, we don't have a national disclosure system for that in Australia. Changes to the National Construction Code will be introduced next year, plus a scorecard to assess the energy efficiency of existing homes. But it's voluntary. Beyond environmental concerns, there are also financial reasons homeowners may consider opting in. Research has found properties with features like solar panels or grey water systems are worth more they're actually being sold at a much higher price compared to the median price for the suburb and also quicker as well. Jason York has seen rising demand for the insulation he installs as homeowners go green. But he warns a box ticked stating a house is insulated is no guarantee it actually works. Thermal properties are only going to go so far until we change the building standards. A message from the front line of building. Stephanie Chalmers, ABC News. Now this next story is also sort of homeowner oriented, uh, so stick with us for a tick on that. Uh, climate change discussion in Australia over the last 10 to 15 years has really been dominated by the climate change policy wars and we've all been driven mad by that. This next story is really important. It's looking at rewiring Australian homes to make them more energy efficient. And it's based on a program that happened in the United States. And it's really interesting because an Australian played a key figure in what happened in the United States. And he'll also be really important in what happens here now.
I'm Linda and my husband's Neville. We're both retired people. It's 27 years we've been here and 27 years we've been married, so... It was easy to remember. <laughs> <laughs> the Hicks family home in suburban Adelaide has recently been radically modernised with a household battery and new solar panels. Obviously we've got um, appliances that most people have got in their home, you know. Um, I've got my sewing machine, our coffee machines and um, washing machines and vacuum ironing cleaner. and vacuum cleaner, TVs. And I've got my electric lawnmower. But while this home might seem ahead of the curve, even they are missing out on some of the biggest household savings and emissions reductions, which could be provided by rapid and large-scale electrification by rewiring our household energy use. Around 42% of Australia's emissions are linked to fossil fuels across our 10 million homes. Homes full of voters. And 74% say the benefits of taking further action on climate change will outweigh the costs, according to the Lowy Institute. Sadly, people have the impression that we can't fix climate and still have the American dream. That's not true. Australian-American engineer Dr Saul Griffith is regarded as something of a rock star in the renewables and energy space, advocating for mass electrification through the organisation Rewiring America. In 2018, I worked with the Department of Energy to map the entire US energy system, where energy comes from and where it goes. Now he's rewiring Australia. The politics of climate in Australia is poised to change. The household is in the key position to drive that change because the householder is where the savings are to be realised. The research found that with predictable improvements in technology costs over the next 15 years and with the right finance and interest rates, the average Australian household could be saving up to $5,000 per year by the end of the decade on their energy costs and upwards of $6,000 per year by 2035. Plus, it could create 1.3 million jobs and save the nation $38 billion per year by 2030. If all of the machines that are already born and in the world today live out their natural life, that'll take us to 1.8 degrees. So, um, so the urgency is literally immediate. We must replace all of these demand side end use machines with the clean electric equivalent as fast as possible. The biggest outlay in energy costs and source of emissions for the Hicks is their two cars. We have two cars. Um, one is used more than the other. Yeah. But unfortunately, the cars we've got are new cars. So if you take a typical Australian vehicle, it's 15 to 20 cents per kilometre to drive it. If that same size car, same shape car is electric and you're running that off solar on your roof, that'll cost you about one cent a kilometre to drive. There's another technology like the electric vehicle that's a little bit magical, it's called a heat pump. Uh, Australians know them as uh, their split systems. Just quietly, they're known as heat pumps too in Tasmania and I know that now because I've moved here on the mainland, as we call it here, they've known it as a split system for a long time. And that heat pump can produce three or four units of heat for one unit of electricity in, so it's enormously efficient, about four times more so than natural gas. And once again, if you're running that off solar on your rooftop or running that off solar off your grid, it's, you know, I think we calculated Natural gas running a hot shower, a long eight minute shower, might cost you about 80 cents, but if you're running that with a heat pump off the solar on your roof, it'll cost you about 10 cents. It's research that could show the major parties a pathway for more aggressive emissions reductions through hip pocket savings. We're trying to solve the problem of the culture war against climate change that's been going on for 20 or 30 years by showing that everyone can win. It's a positive future that we're going towards and it's going to be savings for households, it's going to be huge numbers of jobs created and that uh, we need to do it with urgency to make those things come true. Now when you hear the term net zero, you probably think about the big picture stuff, what nations are doing to reach that net zero uh, emission target by 2030 or even 2050. But some individuals are actually making that their own personal goal and this story is a good example of that. When Ben O'Callaghan designed his home, sustainability was top of mind. Double glazed windows, specific blinds, insulation and solar panels all help him operate a net zero household. 
I was able to face the house the right way, use the right type of glass, use fans around the house and shading in the important places. Net zero means Ben's home is producing as much energy as it consumes. While it does feature high-tech solutions to cut both carbon and bills, sometimes simplicity is best. Every October I put up this shade cloth and it keeps the room really cool. In Australia, newly built homes require at least a six-star energy performance rating, though across the board, the standard plummets. We estimate that the existing housing stock um, is probably around two stars. But you can make improvements. The Little family is working to retrofit their Camp Hill home. Reducing the drafts, putting coverings over the windows. We don't have, like, we've got this big sliding door at the back which doesn't have any coverings and I feel like we get a lot of, you know, loss of insulation through that. It's a gradual process with long-term benefits. Currently we still use gas for our stovetop and also hot water. We want to get rid of gas completely if we can uh, and also look at um, increasing the solar that we've got on our roof. If you're not sure where to start when it comes to being energy conscious, scientists have some ideas. Firstly, make sure your windows and doors are sealed properly. That way, if you do turn the aircon on in summer, you won't be letting the cool air escape outside. Think about shade. Plants can help shade windows and cool your home. But if you don't have a green thumb, curtains and blinds will work too. And if your washing machine or dishwasher breaks, try to replace it with a more energy efficient model that fits with your budget. Taking small steps towards a net zero future. We've got an end game where we want to be a fully electric, you know, ultimately with an electric car, but we've got to plan that out and hopefully over the next three or four years we'll be, you know, meeting that goal, but progressively do it. I really like that story because it shows us the practical things that you can do to save money by better insulating your home, planting trees, making curtains, that kind of thing. Now this next story is a good one, I reckon. It's teaching kids about renewable energy, but it's had a terrific benefit for the school. It saved them $40,000. That's right, a cool 40 grand. These students know more than most how much energy we use each day. They attend Hewenville High School, which hosts an internationally recognised renewable energy hub. This little school in the Hewen Valley is actually doing amazing things. I realised how important saving energy is and how important the world is. The initiative not only powers up deep fryers, it's transforming the community. It's raised awareness of renewable energy and energy efficiency and opportunities um, in the community for engaging them around that sort of technology. And renewables can do a lot more than cook donuts. Michael Fewings powers his entire house with solar and a home-built hydroelectric system. I bring my the te technological know-how of electricity and also my love of of the kids learning. I don't think we even touch the surface of kids understanding about what the future is in regards to you know climate change and renewables and how that's all going to drive a much better future for us all. Back at Hewenville High, renewables have saved more than $40,000 in energy costs since 2017 and in a world where adults make the decisions, the Energy Hub is giving students a renewed sense of purpose and control over their future. Being part of Zide has definitely helped me feel like I'm doing something, I'm making a change and that has reassured me uh, to, you know, not be so worried, not be so frustrated with the world. The sweet success of renewable energy. To those kids, to borrow a riff, you've got the power. Well done. Now remember, if you want more stories like these, you can subscribe to the regular newsletter, The Bright Side. You can subscribe at abc.net.au slash The Bright Side. If you want to see those stories without my mug intervening, we'll have them cut individually on our iView website. We've got a collection there called The Bright Side. Until next time, thank you for your company on The Bright Side. You can find more ABC stories looking at the bright side on the left of your screen. We're not just talking about the problems, but the solutions to those problems. And if you want the bright side in your inbox, subscribe to our newsletter on the ABC website. And for the latest ABC news here on YouTube, subscribe to our channel.